Grace to you and peace from God our Father and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever done something that seemed like a really good idea right up until the point where it turned out to not be a good idea? Yeah. You know, something like, I don't know, like taking your kids and all their friends to the trampoline park and having a really good time there until you can't move the next day. Or enjoying a late night out with friends until you have to get up early the next morning. Or taking that time off of work to just kind of relax and slack off a little until all those projects are due at once and you have to work late to finish them. The same thing goes for your homework too, huh? And if you can't think of something yourself, the internet is really good for this type of story. It's full of videos and stories of doing things that sound really great until they're not. Like doing that really great skateboard trick that sounds really wonderful until it causes a horrible, sometimes funny fall. Or teasing the gorilla at the zoo seems really amusing until it comes after you and attacks the glass. Or playing a joke on your friend, that sounds like a really good time, until they take it the wrong way or respond in a way that backfires on you or they try and get even. We all have experiences like that that seem really good at first, but turn out to have some not so great consequences. Things that sound really good until we try them or think them through a little more thoroughly. And that seems to be what's happening in our gospel reading today. The people of Nazareth are probably super excited about Jesus being in town. He's starting to make a name for himself in the rest of the world. People are talking about him. His teachings and his miracles are making names. And I'm sure the people of Nazareth are going, that's our boy. Jesus has broken out of the small town life. He has followers and a reputation. He's living a much more exotic life than most people of his time ever will. And now he's come home. And the people are so excited. Jesus is gonna be the guest preacher at synagogue. They're finally going to see their hometown hero in action. And at first, Jesus is everything they hope he is. They want him to do well and they are impressed with his teaching. They're excited about what he's saying and they are taken by his authority. But it doesn't last long <clears throat> because they start to think a little bit and understand the things Jesus is saying. They see past their surface excitement and realize that some of the things Jesus is saying, they don't actually like. They're things that challenge them in different ways, that put them on the defensive, call out their expectations and then refuse to give in or even soften the blow a little. Jesus talks about how prophets aren't welcome in their hometown. He speaks to the expectations of the people and then refuses to put on a show for them. And then he pushes it a step further by insisting that his miracles are for outsiders. And that's the way God wants it. To the people of Nazareth, Jesus sounded like a really good idea. And what he said sounded like a really good idea until it didn't anymore. And then they were so angry by this supposed betrayal that they try to throw him off a cliff. They want to kill him for his words. We're not all that different from the people of Nazareth. So much of what Jesus says and what we read in the Bible sounds wonderful. Jesus says things like, love your neighbor, go make disciples of all nations, follow me. And then there's other ones that we, we love to repeat, right? The first will be last and the last will be first. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Don't worry about anything. Let the children come to me. I am the way and the truth and the life. We love to quote these sayings. We use them regularly. But how often 
do we really delve into what they are asking of us? How often do we really take them for what they mean and follow them accordingly? Love your neighbor? Sounds great, doesn't it? Right up until we realize that when Jesus says that, he's telling a story and the neighbor is the enemy. The neighbor is an oppressor, an outsider. How do we love our neighbor when we've been taught to hate them all of our lives? Or believe that they don't belong in our neighborhoods? How do we love our neighbor when it's someone who's hurt us or betrayed us or threatened us? How do we love our neighbor when their faith makes us nervous or their way of life confuses us? How do we love our neighbor when they don't act or think or function the way we think they should? How do we love our neighbor when we disagree, sometimes intensely, about our thoughts and beliefs? And yet, these people are our neighbors the ones in need, the ones without, the ones who are left behind and ostracized and oppressed. Our neighbors are the ones we would prefer not to think about or who we wish we were not a part of our lives. And we are called to love them. And that's not the only saying with some pretty intense meaning. Go and make disciples of all nations, Jesus says. Oh, yes, that sounds wonderful. Well, we are called to do that. Except that means being willing to talk about our faith. It means being able to express our faith in a way that people can understand. It means thinking about our faith enough to be able to do that. And then we're supposed to make disciples of all nations, Not just our comfort zone, not just the places we think need God, not just the places that we think are worthy of God's love, all nations. And I think the most important part of that particular phrase, go and make disciples of all nations, is Jesus tells us to go. I don't think he means sit in church or stay where we're comfortable and safe and know everyone. We are called to go out into the world, into the places that we don't know, and talk about Jesus. Oh, that doesn't sound so great anymore. And Jesus says, follow me. Now that one sounds pretty straightforward. Until we realize that every time Jesus says, follow me, it's connected to something else. Like, give away all you have and follow me. Or deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Now I will admit, I don't get this right either. In fact, I should probably be sitting in one of these chairs listening to this sermon. Because I like the comfortable places too. I don't like having to care about people that bother me. And I don't want to give up all my things to follow Jesus. And sometimes I would rather not tell people what I do on Sunday mornings. I think sometimes we are fa- when we are faced with the stark reality of these sayings and not just the feel-good phrases we're used to, it can be really scary. And we can get defensive, and when we get defensive, we can go on the offensive, just like the people of Nazareth. And then we try and throw Jesus off a cliff. We throw up our hands and we say there's no way anyone can live this way. It asks too much. It takes too much. It demands what we don't believe in. It's too scary and too dangerous. And we want to throw Jesus and his teachings off that cliff. The people of Nazareth don't like what they hear. And they want to throw Jesus off a cliff. They want immediately to end the words that they don't want to hear, the call to something they don't want to consider. But you know what? They don't throw him off the cliff. They have every intention of doing just that. But Jesus walks through their midst. 
And I find that phrase really interesting. The Bible says it that way. He walked through their midst. Jesus doesn't get away. He doesn't leave them. He is in their midst. Even though they want to kill him, he walks right through the middle of them. And he doesn't fight back. And he doesn't condemn them. And he doesn't write them off. The people of Nazareth want to kill Jesus. And Jesus is with them, in the middle of them, despite it all. Jesus' teachings may take us aback when we really think about them or really listen to them. We may even become defensive and angry. But Jesus is in our midst even then. Jesus is with us, walking with us, calling us to better understanding of what his life and teachings are all about. We are not alone as we wrestle with what it means to more closely follow Jesus and his teachings. Jesus is with us, reminding us of all that he has done for us, holding us and helping us to take even the smallest step, showing us the way despite our hesitation and showering us with God's love despite it all. Jesus is in the midst of us, with us, while we struggle and attempt to understand. Amen.